Good morning, church, wherever you may be. They allow a few of us in the auditorium and a lot of us at home. So if you're at home, snuggled up in your PJs watching church this morning on this very cold, wet, miserable day, then you are smarter than I. And uh, we want to welcome you here. We're the bunnies that have gone out in the rain and turned up at the church building. But uh, God bless you wherever you are. We've been doing a series on heroes. Many of you have said how much you appreciate it. I'm looking at the book of Judges. It's a book that is full of heroes. And I'd like you this morning to turn to Judges chapter 4. We're going to wrap this up now. I've been avoiding this one because of the controversy it's about to, maybe about to have happened. But I hope to neutralize that because I think that God is bigger than any controversy. Don't you? Like any contention that we have, God is bigger than that. So Judges chapter 4. Verses 1 to 2, we see the same cycle repeated, you know, through the years and the decades for the people of Israel. Verse 1 says this, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. Remember we did Ehud a couple of weeks ago? He's the guy who plunged the sword into the fat belly and the fat closed around it and the dung came out and all that kind of cool stuff. Sorry, gruesome stuff. The guys like that stuff, you know. Um, And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan who reigned in Hazor, and the commander of his army was Sisera. Now, Sisera was a very famous commander of the army. Now, we live at a time in history right now when uh, heroes are being raised up from the common people. Heroes are no longer sporting heroes or movie heroes. Heroes tend to be people who are like first responders, healthcare workers. You know, we're celebrating them at this moment, and so we should. Because it's a day when ordinary people like you and I can step into the role of becoming a hero. And today I want to look at a team that rescued Israel from Canaanite oppression. Uh, The team were Barak and uh, Deborah. Now in ancient Israel, much like today, sexism was alive and well. Women back then were essentially second class citizens. They were considered inferior to men and they were considered basically the property of men. So this is common. This has been common throughout history and it still lives today. And in most areas of society, women have been liberated at least to a degree and uh, they now have equal rights, they can vote and that sort of stuff. But this, this prejudice against women is still very common, sadly, amongst church folk. Now, I don't want to enter into a debate now about women in ministry. We've produced a 16, 17-page document. If you're interested in that, um, send us an email. We'll send that to you, outlining our position on women in ministry. But for those of you who don't think women, who think women should be seen and not heard, uh, you're going to have a problem with Deborah. Because um, Deborah was a woman judge in Israel. Can a woman be a judge? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe she can and uh, woman was, this woman, Deborah, was a judge in Israel. Look at chapter, Judges chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Look at this. Now Deborah, not Judy, I might point out, but Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lepithroth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came to her for judgment. So this lady was judgment in much the same way uh, Samuel was later on he was a judge but also a prophet Deborah was a prophetess but also a judge she led her people now many people say well God appointed a woman because he couldn't find a man to do the job like that's a prejudicial statement in itself God raises people up and some of them are men and some of them are women now in in most of the, the society back then and even today you know men are in charge if you like But women have a role to play. And that's what I want to look at today. See, now, Deborah was the only judge, and all the ones listed was the only judge that was a woman. But she was also the only judge who was not a a, a military leader. She was not a general. She wasn't a warrior. Now, before you get all up at at me and God for putting a woman in a position of authority, you need to stop and recognise God raises people up, men and women, to unique and specific roles. So Deborah could hear from God, she was a prophetess, and she was leading the people. But she had this other guy on the side who was part of her dream team. And his name was, was Barak, and he was the leader of the army. He was the warrior. So what, I, I don't want you to... People are going to sit around saying, well, you know, who was in charge? Who was over who? I don't want you to say, What I want you to see is that a man and a woman uniquely gifted in their roles formed a dream team. They were in unity. And they weren't sitting around arguing about who was in control. They were in unity. Look at uh, verse 6. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, 
from Kadesh Naphtali and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 of them from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun. So in an incredibly sexist society back then, I want you to see that God is using an anointed woman and an anointed man together as a team. There's no top dog on the totem pole here. When we read this, people want to debate, well, who was in charge? Was she in charge of him? Was he in charge of her? No, this is two different people with two different skill sets that God is bringing up to work together in unity to bring about what he has in mind. Each one was in charge of their own area. So Deborah, her gift was hearing God and she was able to pass that on to the people. And so she set the direction for the nation. Barak's gift was actually getting the fighting done. He was a warrior. She didn't sit around and tell him, well, Barak, you better move your troops over here. You better, you know. She didn't tell him how to control his bit and he didn't tell her how to hear from God. But the, each of them had a unique gift and they brought them together and together they became a team. See, Deborah was perceived by the entire nation as well as Commander Barak as, as having a hotline to God. She could lead the army. But this is, it's not about who's in charge of whom here. This is about two complementary skill sets that God raised up, happened to be in a man and a woman, and he got them to work together as a team. See, Romans, we forget about this. We want to argue theology on a bunch of stuff, but listen to Romans 12, verses 4 to 5. Listen to this. Paul writes, For as one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one in the body of Christ and individually members one of another. What he's saying, he's calling for unity. And there's loads of scripture references calling for God's people to stand in unity. So instead of debating who's in charge, we should pull together in unity. Each person shining in the role and the gift that God has given them. Deborah sought the Lord, Barak fought the fight, and together the two of them formed a great team and were in unity. And life's like that as well. It should be like that in your marriage. So, for example, in my marriage, I mean, I'm the head of the family because I am the man and I'm the head of the family. But Fiona is the head of the cooking and the grocery shopping and all that stuff. Why? Because she, have you tasted my cooking? She is a lot better at it than I am. And so, you know, God's uniquely, gift. If, if I was going to be a misogynist, I'd come in and say, hey, you can't be in charge of something. I want to be in charge of that. But, you know, trust me. Our family would suffer if I was in charge of... I mean, can you imagine? My, our, our, my freezer would be full of frozen pizzas. You know, because she is uniquely gifted and loves what she's doing there. And so the smart move is that we let each one shine in their particular gifting and then together we can move in unity. I don't sit around saying, well, I'm better than you because I'm in charge of this and you're only in charge of that. No, no, we're a team and we pull together. And that's what it should be. And it's the same in church. The church should be a team. I mean, we, we have Zach slash Cam who does our books. I don't, walk, I don't go around telling him how to do the book work because that's his area. I let him just take charge of that because I know nothing about book work. When, when we have a board meeting and he says, I want to share the latest profit and loss with you, my eyes just glaze over. I'm like, yeah, whatever. What's the bottom line, you know? Because the, he's gifted at this and I'm not. So the smart move is to be a team, to let him shine what he does well and to let me shine doing what I'm well. It's the same with my admin. If you know anything about myself, I cannot organise my way out of a wet paper bag in a snowstorm. I'm terrible. And so Tanya comes along and she organises my diary. And it's brilliant. I don't have to control her. She basically controls me because she tells me when I'm supposed to be, who I'm supposed to call, all that sort of stuff. Because she's really good at that and I'm really bad. So, see, a team is where we can each do our own individual thing but shine because we join together in unity as opposed to fighting with one another over who has the best role. So Deb, Deborah and Barak were a team and each one had a unique role to play. Frankly, we need to join hands together. There is too much division. There is too much division in churches today over perceived biblical interpretations, most of which are not our core beliefs. Yet, like, human beings will divide over anything. We will, we, we will join factions at every opportunity we've got. It's like, you know, you can't put 
uh, half a dozen football lovers in a room and have them all support the same team. Everybody goes for a different team. They all have their own perspectives and their own prejudices. But I believe right now, at this particular moment in history, it's time for us to lay our prejudices and our preferences aside and join our principles together and stand in unity. You know, as a leader, I can tolerate people disagreeing with me. It happens all the time. But unless it's a salvation issue, I, don't, I won't bend on a salvation issue. If you come to me and tell me you can get saved by doing something other than receiving Jesus Christ as Lord, we're going to have a problem because that's a core issue for me. should be for you. But I can disagree on matters of doctrine, interpretation, preference, and still be in unity. Unity doesn't mean that we see eye to eye on everything, but it does mean that we can walk hand in hand into our future together. That's what it is. Unity is not uniformity. We can have differences of opinion, we cannot, but we say we're going to let those go and we're going to join together on what's important. A Canadian farmer lost his two-year-old boy in a cornfield one time. He called his neighbours together. He said, quick, search for the child. Search for the child, please. It's getting cold. The corn's just about due to be harvested. He said, search for the child, but look, be careful with the corn. We're about to harvest it. So they sort of poked around and looked into it. They couldn't find the child. It's getting later. It's getting colder. It drops to below zero. A two-year-old child is out there somewhere in this sea of corn. And he gathers all the men together. And he says, listen, forget the corn. I don't care about that anymore. Let's join hands together. We'll trample the corn, but we've got to find my son. So they join hands together. And they start trampling out the corn in a big line. And eventually they find the little boy curled up in a hole in the ground dead, frozen. He froze to death out there while they were busy trying to step tiptoe around the corn. And the farmer turned to the other men and he said, gentlemen, we should have joined hands sooner. And that's my plea to you, to all of us today. We need to join hands sooner to let the petty differences go and join together in unity and become one. Perhaps more than any other time in history, this world needs to see a church that is united and brings their strengths and gifts to the table and uses them together for the greater good. Just as Barak and Deborah did. See, Deborah said in Judges chapter 4, verse 7, have a look at this. She says that this is her bit. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river of Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. So the Hebrew word for, for draw is the word masak, which means to sow or to drag out or to pull down on or draw down on. So Deborah's role was to, was to lure Sisera out into the middle of this valley. And then she said, I will give them into your hands. She's speaking for the Lord here. So Barak's role was to get ready in and around that, that valley, get ready to, to, to let fly and to wipe these guys out and win the victory. But Barak hesitated because he, he, was, he was scared. He didn't want to do it alone. And he says in verse 8 and 9, Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, well, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. <coughs> then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Now, Barak was scared. How many of us looking forward at this world at the moment are scared? I tell you, I am. I'm scared about, about what it's going to look like. I'm scared about what our future is going to look like with all this pandemic and stuff like that. But it's okay to be scared. He was scared. He knew that the prophetess, God's representative, he, he said, I want God's representative to go with me. Deborah, I need you to come with me. And she agreed, but she said because of his lack of faith, the, the, the final glory will go to a woman. He said, I don't care about that. You know, I, I just need you to go with me. He said, I need to know that you are here with me. So when Deborah said that about the woman, it wasn't an insult or a threat. It was a consequence. It was what was going to happen. And listen, at this point in time, at any point in time, it's okay to be scared. John Wayne said, that, how many of you like John Wayne? Pilgrim. I love him. He's, he's awesome. One of my favorite. John Wayne said this, courage is being scared to death and mounting up anyway. And that's what I want you to do today. We look forward, we're scared to death of what the world is going to look like. We're scared about what church is going to look like. But today, I'm calling you to mount up anyway. Whether you're scared or not, whether you agree or not, whether you're not sure about stuff, whether you've got opinions, or, or, just let it go and let's mount up together. Let's ride into the sunset together. 
Galatians 6 verse 9 says this, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. This COVID thing, I tell you, I don't know about you, but I'm getting weary of it. Anybody here getting weary of it? You're out there in Facebook land. You're getting weary of this stuff? Man, it's driving me. Man, it's just grinding us down, isn't it? It's gone on for too long. It's hard yakka. It's restrictive. But what I'm saying to you, church, is let's stay the course. Let's see this thing through. Don't give up on church. You know, Ignite is changing. We're going to change the way we're going to do church as a result of this pandemic, I believe, long into the future. But, but God still wants us to be a church. He wants us to be a family. He wants us to be in unity. So let's covenant together to see it through. We may not agree on all the, the ways that church should be done in these challenging times, but I want you to be in unity. We want to leave no man, no woman behind as we move forward. Fiona mentioned to me this morning, there's another pastor, friend of ours on the coast, put a little post up this morning on Facebook and she read it to me. And it's a really good post because it talks about Abraham. It said, how, how fast did Abraham get to the promised land? And the answer is as fast as the slowest member of his family. Because we want to rush out into the future. But, you know, we've got to, we've got to love one another. See, they don't know we are Christians by the way we judge one another. They won't know we are Christians by the way we have prejudices. They won't know we are Christians by the way we sing or the way we are preached. They will know we are Christians by the way we love. And we need to love even our brothers who struggle with some of the changes that are going on. Just love them. Don't say, well, we're going on ahead. You can catch up later on. That's not love. Love says, hey, come with me. We should have joined hands sooner. So let's get to the battle. Let's get to the cool stuff. Um, Barak's heart must have just melted when he looked down on that valley and there is 900 chariots of iron in the valley. And he's th the, the Israelites don't have any chariots and they're looking down and here's all these chariots. It's like looking at a tank corps when you're an infantryman. You think, boy, this is going to be ugly, you know. The details of this battle, actually, we don't get from from Judges chapter 4, we get it from chapter 5 where Barak and Deborah sing a song about what happened. But this is what actually happened in, on the day there. He looked at, he looks across this valley, there's 900 chariots of iron. He goes, man, he's quaking in his boots. But then he hears a, a crack of thunder from behind him. He turns around and here comes this storm rolling into the valley. And it is pouring rain. It's teeming, a bit like outside here right now, teeming with rain. Absolutely pouring. And so those 900 iron chariots become 900 iron coffins because their wheels get stuck in the mud and they can't move them. They're stuck. They can't maneuver them. And the people of Israel, Barak's 10,000 men, sweep forward and they defeat the enemy that day. And the remnant, including Sisera, fled not in their chariots because they couldn't move them. They were stuck in the mud. Sisera and, and a few others fled on foot. And Barak was in hot pursuit because he said, I want this opposition guy. I want this guy. He's mine. And he's pursuing him. Judges 4.15 says this, And the Lord routed Sisera and all of his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. So that's the situation. The battle is won. There's one guy to get. He's the commander. Barak's chasing him. Sisera's running off into the distance. I wonder what's going to happen. But I will say this to you. Beware, beware of a woman with a tent peg. Hey, let's read on and have a look at what happens. Sisera flees. The only ally he had in the whole place was a fellow called Heber the Kenite. He was a nomad. <coughs> and he happened to be pitching his tents close to the battle scene. So he runs to Heber's tents. Heber's not there. His wife Jael is there. And she offered him sanctuary. Judges 4 verse 18. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord. Turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. I'm always worried about... There's a TV show called Wives with Knives. I'm always worried about that. Don't be afraid. Okay? She turned aside. To, uh, so, he, so he turned aside to her in the tent and she covered him with a rug. So here she is. Quick, come in here. Hop under this rug. Let's cover it over. She gives him sanctuary. <coughs> so here he is on the run. What's going to happen? Well, she gives him a nice glass of milk, settles him down, sings him a lullaby. It's time for you to go to sleep. Verse 20 says this. Um, Sisera said to her, stand in the opening of the tent and if any man comes to you and asks, is anyone here, say no. Okay, she says, fair enough. Now Sisera can relax, he's exhausted, he falls asleep and that's when Jael had him pegged. 
Verse 21. There'll be a few of these. Look out. Jael, the wife of Heba, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. This is where it gets a bit graphic. If you want to turn the sound down now, you can. Then she went softly to him and drove the tent peg into his temple until he went down into the ground while he was lying fast, until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness, and so he died. So at that moment there, something went through Sisera's head that had never been through it before. And by the time Barak arrived, Jael had made her point. She, not Barak, had nailed Sisera. I told you there was a few of these coming out. So verse 22, and behold, Barak went pursue, was pursuing Sisera. Jael went out to meet him and said, come, I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So she went into the tent and there lay Sisera dead with the tent peg in his temple. And so on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of, Je- of Canaan, before the people of Israel. What an amazing story. And uh, it's a story of a team. Uh, they didn't even know J.L. was on, her t- on the team, but she was on the team. And it's how a team beat these guys, not one. So I say it's the only judge where there's more than one judge involved. And each one takes a specific role. So I don't know about you, but I think that's something to sing about. So Deborah and Barak started to sing. They had write this incredible song in Judges chapter 5. I won't read all of it to you, but let me highlight a few things. Verse 2, that the leaders took the lead in Israel and that the people willingly offered themselves... Bless the Lord. So see, the leaders led and the people offered themselves and they were in unity and they were a team. Uh, Verse 12. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake. Break out in song. Awake, Barak. Lead away your captives, O son of Abinoam. See, Jael features in the song even though she's the wife of 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 the lowly wife of a lowly nomad. But, you know, for her, she was the one who did something big for God because she was willing. And it doesn't... If, if you don't care who gets the credit, you can do anything for God. Right? And the Lord is looking for people who give the glory to him, but still do the work. Because it's about glorifying the Lord in the end. So while some read this story and are busy debating over who was in charge of whom, I believe God's given us a huge key right here in this story. And the key is... God's in charge of the whole nation and he uses a man and a woman with unique talents and he lets them do what they do really well. And he crowns that with an incredible victory. In an age of protests against prejudice, which we're seeing all around the world right now, the church should lead the way by standing in unity, shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, black and white, men and women, old and young. We are one spirit. We're not a bunch of individuals. We are one spirit. I believe it's time to stand together. You know, in this lockdown, the enemy has done his absolute best to divide us, to isolate us, to separate us, because he knows that the real strength of our witness comes when we stand together as one. It is time for us to stand together as one in unity. Psalm 133 verse 1, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. For there the Lord bestows a blessing. 1 Peter 3 verse 8. Finally, this is directly from the Apostle Peter. He says this to the churches. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. Have unity. Jesus himself said, a house divided will not stand. And he is absolutely right. If we are busy fighting one another, we cannot fight the enemy. We have to stand together as one. And instead of getting stuck into, well, that's not your bit, that's my bit, you can't, you know, no, let's just all serve in unity. Let's do what we do, whatever it is that the Lord has called us to do. Let's do it with joy. Let's do it with a humble, what does it say there? A tender heart, a heart full of sympathy and a humble mind. Let's do that. See, already in this pandemic, some have fallen away, saying, saying they want to stay home and worship God their own way. But this plays right into the hands of the devil, folks. He's doing everything he can to divide the church right now. And people are saying, oh, well, at least, you know, in a couple of weeks, we'll be able to have church again. Really? Have you seen the restrictions that are on churches? The restrictions are far greater on churches than they are on pubs, clubs and sporting events. Why? Because we are being prejudiced against by our government. We are being attacked by our government. Churches are singled out for treatment that no one else has. So the rules as they stand, you can have up to 100 if you have church in a cavern or a stadium. 
but you have to have four square metres around every person. It's only two in a pub and a club, apparently, but four square metres around every person, or seven square metres if you sing. So you can go to a sporting event and scream and yell and holler and spit, and that's okay. But if you go to church and sing, you can't do that. You need seven metres, seven square metres around you. What a ridiculous rule. Lawmakers, get it right. Stop persecuting the church through the back door and using this pandemic as a way of trying to knock churches. No, this is our church is part of our society. We are a family and we are one and we are in unity. And it doesn't matter what you do, we need to stand in unity, folks, in the church today. We really do. So we need to drop these petty grievances and stuff. Now is the time to put them aside and stand together as one. You might think you're right on a particular issue. You might say, well, God's on my side and the Bible says this. But I'll tell you, every issue in the church that I've ever looked at, every area of controversy, people argue from the Bible from both sides. There is no bang absolute right and wrong in most of this stuff. There are verses supporting either way because it, don't make your preference a principle. It's your preference. I get it. It's the way you'd rather have it. But don't make it a principle because there are Bible scriptures that will argue both ways. So unless it's a core value, as I said, like salvation by faith in Jesus Christ alone, we cannot lay our preferences and interpretations aside, you know, we, well, we, why can we not do that? Lay them aside and stand together as one in unity. And if you're so biblical, why don't you check out some of the verses on unity? Because if you're going to be biblical, let's be biblical about unity, number one, and your preferences further down the list. And there's loads of verses on unity. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, yet another one. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus, that all of you agree that there be no division among you, that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Right, Paul, Paul is crying out, he's saying, please just get on with one another. Just agree to disagree, but just agree. Stop letting disagreement. I've seen churches split over crazy stuff, the colour of the carpet. Have a church split over the colour of the carpet. I've seen churches split. I was in a Baptist church where the church nearly split over the overuse of water. In baptisms. That doesn't, even make, that doesn't even make any sense, you know. There is so, these are so petty. Look, if you're going to be biblical, pick up the verses on unity and believe in them. Because God is calling us to stand as one. It's time to stop our preferences becoming prejudices and to celebrate what unites us rather than what divides us. At this moment in history, I believe if we are willing and obedient and we stand together in unity, then we can see God do a new thing in our nation. And we can be a part of it. We can be right at the centre of it if we stand together in unity. So I'm going to call upon you this morning to come and be part of the dream team here at Ignite. Whatever it is that the Lord is calling you to do, come and join us. And let us support you and love you and get behind you. Because when we stand together, the enemy shakes. I'm telling you now. He's, he's, he's dividing people as hard as he can right now. And the greatest thing you can do to defeat the devil right at this moment is to stand together in unity. Because together we are better. Renio Satori said this, individually we are one drop, but together we are an ocean. And I believe that the Lord is calling us right here, right now, as a church, in all of this fragmentation and segmentation, to join together in unity, as Deborah and Barak did. Two different people with different roles and even different sexes, but they joined together in unity and brought about a great victory for the Lord. Hebrews 10, verses 23 and on says this, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may stir one another up towards love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Look, I know you can do church at home. Many of you are forced to do it right now. But I want to encourage you, when you have opportunity, when we roll out a, a new structure and a plan, here, come and get involved. Don't sit at home in your PJs. I know it's comfortable, but God, God didn't call us just to be comfortable. Simple for Christianity is a cross, not a cushion. 
So, you know, you're not called to be comfortable. I'm calling you to come and stand with us. Be a part of our family. Be a part of our community. We can and will triumph over this pandemic. But don't be like that verse says, like the ones who are giving up meeting, neglecting meeting together. This is our moment. I know we can't right now. But in, in a short period of time, this, the restrictions are going to ease and I believe that we will be able to stand together as one, as the body that God has called us to be. So, you know, someone said to me, oh, yeah, but, you know, I could go. Look, you can find better, better, better sermons than mine on YouTube. You can find better worship than ours on YouTube. You can do, the, you can do your whole life on YouTube. But it's not, you know the problem? It's not your people. It's not your tribe. It's not your family. You know? I remember when my kids were, were, were growing up, I remember going to see them in, in, in music productions at school, Tara singing and that sort of stuff, right? And I know there were other singers there. They might have been better singers, better actors, you know, better dresses, whatever. But I'm looking for mine. I'm looking for my daughter. What? Oh, look, listen to her sing. That's incredible. Why? Is it because she's better or worse? Not particularly. It's because she's mine. She's my family. Now you can find people on YouTube, but they're not yours. We are yours. We are community. We are one. And so I believe that God's calling us right now as we go through these changes to say, come, stand with us as one. Because there is power in unity. Back in the book of Genesis, God dispenses with the Tower of Babel. Why? If you read back there in Genesis, he says, if these people are in unity, there is nothing they cannot do. God knows the power and unity, and so does the devil. So he's trying to thwart it right now. He's trying to stop it right now. He's trying, to, he's trying to make you stay home, make you not get engaged, make you not get on Zoom meetings. I know it's hard. It's laborious. Tell me about it. I'm over it. I was over it three months ago. But we do it because we can join together in unity. We can stand together as one. We are one in the arms of the Lord. When he puts his arms out, he gathers us up, and we are one. With all of our weirdness, all of our prejudices, all of our preferences, black and white, men and women, old and young, we are one. And the Lord has called us and says how good and pleasant it is when we live and we dwell in unity. Let's pray together. I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer with me. Wherever you are, if you're you know, sitting there having breakfast, putting the baby down, if you're in this room, if you're meeting with other Christians somewhere, if you're watching this, you know, days, nights, weeks later, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Because I'm telling you the greatest power source, the most undiscovered power source, outside of the Holy Spirit himself, is unity. Unity in the Spirit is how we can facilitate his work in our lives. So I'm going to ask you to commit to unity. Commit to, to being part of the body of Christ to not being a lone wolf, to not being out there fighting and slugging it. I tell you, if you are fighting and slugging it out by yourself, the enemy will pick you off. He will. He's not afraid of you. He's afraid of the one who's in you because the one who's in you is greater than the one who's in the world. And he's especially afraid when we join our faith together as one. So I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Just, just search out. Pray with all your heart. I believe more than at any other time in history, God's calling us to stand together as one. Come join us. You have a home here. You have a family. And together, we're going to impact our community and our nation for Jesus Christ and the nations around the world. So pray this with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me for my independent spirit. I repent of that spirit. And I commit myself with all of my heart to serving you, to loving you, and to being in unity with your people. Lord, make us one. As Jesus and the Father were one, Lord, make us one. I believe that Jesus is still praying that high priestly prayer in John 17. Lord, make us one. And so, Father, I pray that for everyone who's prayed this, for those who are hearing even all around the world, our friends 
out there and in all the nations around the world who, who listen in. Father, I pray that we would be one, that we would stop fighting, we would stop attacking one another, we would stop getting frustrated, and that we would just stand as one, realising each of us has unique gifts and abilities to bring to the table. And then when we bring out our loaves and our fishes, the Lord can make a miracle out of it. However petty and small they seem, God makes a miracle out of it. So Lord, I pray that you would join our hearts as one as we move forward, as we find new and exciting ways to do church. Lord, I pray that we would be one, no matter where we are physically, that we would be one in unity. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in today. And uh, we will um, join you in a few moments on the Zoom call. I uh, look forward for those of you who want to do that. But please stay tuned because we have lots that is coming up. The Lord's really speaking into our hearts. I believe he's given us some keys as to how to do church going forward. There's going to be some exciting changes. And I guarantee you, you're going to love it. It might feel weird at first, but you're going to love it. Because God is doing a new thing. See, I'm doing a new thing, says the Lord. The old is gone, the new has come. Well, the new is here. And we need to find a new and a better way of doing church. Not different, better. And that's what I'm asking the Lord for. So God bless you. We'll see you next week and we'll see you tomorrow morning on Sparks. Don't forget to tune into that. See you then. Bye.